Okay, let's let's get started then. Uh, Andre, come come closer. Don't you all hide in the in the darkness there in the, in the darkness? Yeah. Well, you are getting ready for the theater performance that is going to follow after our discussion here. So, it's a good idea. Uh, if you want, you can stay on. Uh, it's it's on the house. If you if you want. There will be a theatrical performance after this dialogue. So uh, this explains, I think, in part at least some of the furniture and uh, you might glance <laughs> at and some of the underwear which is here on the on display. Only only women's underwear, mind you. So there is discrimination in the Balkans, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very happy this evening to welcome to uh, Bucharest and to the. Uh, our series uh, ideas in the Agora, uh, an old uh, friend, uh, and a dear friend, uh, Diana Mishkova, who is a professor of history, and she is also uh, heading, is the founding mother, as it were, uh, and uh, uh, head of the Center for Advanced Study uh, in Sofia. Uh, I have to say a couple of things about the Center for Advanced Study. Uh, everybody knows about the Wissenschaftskolleg to Berlin, which is, was or used to be the center of this network of once flourishing uh, institutes of advanced study in Central and Eastern Europe. Alas, Collegium Budapest is no more. Uh, New Europe College faces uh, difficulties in finding financing and funding for uh, many uh, of its programs. Things have changed. The Business House Collective to Berlin is, is thriving, but not the way it used to. Uh, against this background, the performance of uh, uh, the Center for Advanced Study in Sofia, thanks largely to uh, Diana Mishkova, is really extraordinary. Uh, and first of all, I have to say, this is the place outside Western Europe. We have to face it. We are outside uh, Western Europe. Um, where most of the best uh, ideas and collective projects uh, pertaining to the discussion about East and West have been developed over the last 20 years or so. In many ways, through uh, summer camps, or should I call them boot camps, uh, for students, through collective projects, through a long series of conferences, uh, of seminars, of dialogues, uh, a certain, uh, how shall I put it, uh, a certain community of scholars, mostly young and mid-career, uh, mid-term, uh, has emerged. Uh, a truly transnational uh, community of like-minded scholars that uh, excel in fields such as uh, history, of course, uh, sociology, ethnography, anthropology, social and cultural, geography, human geography, uh, <coughs> and other fields. Uh, this is remarkable because I'm not familiar with any other place uh, on the map of Europe where from uh, a significant uh, debate about the regionalization of Europe has emerged over the last two decades. And small wonder then uh, that uh, some of the projects uh, caught the attention of people from other regions of Europe, and I uh, only mentioned the Nordic countries, for instance, which were engaged actually in a very interesting project about the regionalization of Europe, uh, concentrating on uh, this kind of spagat between the Balkans and the, the Baltic uh, Sea Scandinavian countries. There is, of course, a very interesting in, uh, uh, debate about regionalization per se. Uh, as you know, uh, the debate about historical regions has uh, uh, undergone a very interesting transformation over the last, again, 15-20 uh, years. Um, in novel ways, sometimes these novel ways meant going back 30, 40, 60, 80 years to, uh, and included a re-examination of the idea of historical region uh, region uh, in the various cultures of Central Eastern Europe and Western Europe. And that is, I think, uh, 
quite extraordinary, uh, especially if one takes into account uh, the scarcity of resources that one usually associates with anything happening outside the Western metropolis. So on that, warm congratulations. Now, uh, I won't go into the, uh, the list, long list of publications by uh, Diana Mishkova. You find them in the, some of them in the uh, uh, flyer of this evening. And I will get uh, straight to the point. Um, to the question beyond Balkanism, which I uh, made it into a question, uh, which is related to the latest book by uh, Diana Mishkova, published uh, with Routledge, just called Beyond Balkanism, the Scholarly Politics of Region Making. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the topic, the Balkans and Balkanism in general, of course, uh, the most important book in the field uh, is still uh, Maria Todorova's uh, exceptional book, Imagining the Balkans. Now, Imagining the Balkans and Beyond Balkanism form now a diptych uh, where the two, uh, uh, let's say, interactive uh, uh, discourses that we have on the Balkans, the best we, we have uh, at this time. Uh, while I, I don't want to you know, oppose them to one another. I will go, come back to them uh, recently, uh, shortly. Uh, of course, on the wider topic of uh, Eastern Europe uh, and its invention, the, the classic is still unsurpassed. Uh, the book by Larry Wolf, Inventing Eastern Europe, The Map of Civilization on the Mind of the Enlightenment, where he starts, as we all remember, from uh, examining the necessity that was uh, understood at some point by uh, Western Enlightenment uh, uh, scholars and writers and literati and artists and philosophers and theologians uh, to uh, uh, invent a civilizational slope to superimpose on the map of Europe a civilizational map to pretend that there is a kind of uh, qualitative uh, dimension to geographical space that has to do with the way civilization unfolds. And of course, on this map, uh, with this great, uh, 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 ruthless gradient from uh, the northwest to the southeast, we share a uh, really unenviable uh, position next to our uh, kindred spirits, uh, the Bulgarians across the Danube. Now, when uh, um, I was about to say Diana Todorova, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> there is a little bit of truth to, to, to there this. There is a limit to this. Because there is, a, there is a, a, a complementarity, which I will come to in a second. Uh, Maria Todorova, in her uh, introductory remarks of this classic, says uh, something that goes uh, as follows. Uh, I am here and now, meaning the United States of America, uh, and I'm trying to tell these stories, explain these problems to the people of the here and of the now. Uh, and uh, in so doing, she embarked on a, a process of, um, let's say, analysis or a deconstruction of uh, the, the, the dominant discourses on uh, the Balkans, mostly uh, uh, developed in uh, Western uh, uh, European uh, uh, scholarship. And of course, her most, uh, I would say, her arch enemy or her biggest problem in that book was to struggle with the conflation between um, uh, Balkanism and Orientalism. As you may remember, uh, at about the time in the 1980s when the debate about uh, the Balkans was starting to emerge, it peaked it, in the, the late 1990s. Uh, at that time in the early 1980s, throughout the 1980s, the 1978 book by Edward Said, Orientalism, was making a huge splash. Uh, and uh, Maria had this uh, uh, to do, she simply had to do this, to engage Said in a very frontal way 
to show that whereas Orientalism was dealing with something very hazy, remote, unspecified, uh, unclear, uh, extremely heterogeneous, about which no one could formulate one uh, uh, judgment or say, state one, make one simple statement. Uh, the Middle East and the Orient, uh, already a conflation that went beyond uh, what scholars should normally do. And so she had to deal with that, and she dealt with this quite successfully, uh, and that resulted in a, a, let's say, a clear separation between uh, uh, this uh, stigmatizing, uh, labeling discourse uh, that was constructing the Balkans pretty much a la manière de studies of Orientalism. And that was a heroic <laughs> attempt in the 1990s to, to distance uh, the region from the, at the time, very, very successful discourse of Orientalism. Uh, Diana Mishkova's uh, task was now to, to see uh, while this, let's say, the, the peak of Orientalism is behind us. Uh, there are variations on the topic, some of them from uh, our own uh, region, some of them from uh, people that uh, left the Balkans and Eastern Europe went to the West. Milica, Milica Bakic, Hayden is, is a case in point, who uh, took somehow the, whatever she knew about the former Yugoslavia and the Balkans with her to the West, where she had to confront the stereotypical uh, representations of the Balkans, and thus she came up with the idea, very resilient idea, of nesting Orientalism, which uh, says basically that this is so much embedded, so uh, intrinsic to whatever happens in uh, 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 the area that is in many ways, uh, although uh, artificial, uh, very deeply uh, rooted, deeply seated. Uh, throughout this extraordinary book, uh, Diana Mishkova tries to go beyond Balkanism as a label and as a strong uh, concept, as a hard, let's say, fact. Uh, and then, in so doing, she does something that uh, Maria Todorova was, uh, was not uh, doing, Namely, she engages the discourse about the Balkans as generated by specialists in, uh, from the mid-1917 century on, from the region or from closely neighboring countries such as Austria uh, and all the way the Germanic uh, space. And she uh, uh, tries to see how uh, these uh, home uh, grain discourses and those coming from Western Europe interact, intersect, uh, interject, uh, and so on. And this is, the, to me, the great achievement of this book, which is based on her work over uh, at least two decades, uh, namely that she is uh, uh, really doing justice to the quality, so to the quantity, uh, we have to say, and the institutional uh, 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 solidity of these discourses and research traditions and uh, in uh, all the countries of the area. Uh, of course, we all know that uh, we started in Romania, uh, Yorga and others started in Romania already in 1914, uh, uh, the Institute for Southeast European Studies. It was re-established and developed in the 1920s. Then from the 1937 uh, on, with Victor Papa Costa, we had a, an Institute of Balkan Studies, uh, calling it uh, the Balkans, and it, it, by no accident, because it was in a different kind of discourse. And so these are uh, uh, the traditions to which uh, Diana Mishkova is trying to uh, answer. And now we, we go to, to this. Diana, the first point is this. You know that uh, Romanians are not very happy with being associated with the Balkans. Mm -hmm. uh, parts of the country really have nothing to do with, very little to do with, uh, with the Balkans, geographically, culturally. Romania is split uh, uh, itself in a number of subcultures, mm -hmm. historical traditions <laughs> and so forth. And thus, the proposition that was made when Greater Romania was formed, 
that on the contrary we should come closer to the Balkans. Not with the best intentions, of course, uh, if you saw this from Bulgaria or even from Greece or Yugoslavia, but with uh, a new ambition of this multinational state behaving like a kingdom uh, and increasingly as an empire, uh, developing um, the ambitions of an empire. Byzantium, like in Yorga's dreams, were maybe a kind of count ka equivalent for the Balkans. But Romania became very deeply engaged. Before it became engaged, we had an, before this started really as a very serious preoccupation in foreign policy, in uh, literature, in the arts, uh, we had our first try at uh, Balkanizing the old kingdom with the annexation of Dobroja. In 1878, uh, the uh, new kingdom, which was about to become kingdom, it was on the this kingdom in the making, annexed uh, Dobroja. But rather than, uh, we are not Orientalists then we uh, immediately turned Obroja into a model uh, of uh, a developing region of Romania, and in many ways Dobroja was a kind of testing ground for the modernization projects of the, the entire kingdom. And by uh, uh, the beginning of the Balkan Wars, Dobroja was a more or less Romanian area associated with the ambitious modernization project. Okay. It took the Balkan Wars for uh, Romania to discover the Orientalist dimension of the Balkans. And that was when we took the Kadrilate. When we took so uh, Southern Dobroja, on which we had absolutely no legitimate claim, it was turned due to this extraordinary connection through Queen Mary into the uh, uh, site of Romanian Orientalism. Now suddenly, tens and scores of painters, of poets, and so forth, flocked around Queen Mary, took up residence there, uh, spent time on the, uh, on the Silver Coast uh, in Baltic. This is why on the poster we, we put a picture, a photo, which was uh, taken by Mona, my wife, uh, a few years ago, to, to symbolize this extraordinary fact that somehow in 10 to 15 years this area which had absolutely nothing to do with Romania became a kind of spiritualist orientalist paradise which symbolically was integrated as one of the most interesting parts of the symbolic geography of Romania. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you see that from Bulgaria? How do you look at, at, at Romania from, from Bulgaria? Are we in the Balkans or are we not? Well, first of all, thank you very much, um, Sorin, for inviting me here, for the nice word, the generous presentation, and thank you to all of you for coming here. Um, it is not my task in the book or in answering your question to um, say clearly whether Romania is in the Balkans or out of the Balkans. My task is rather to try to um, tell the story of who and why and how considered Romania part of this space and uh, with what consequences and with what explicit and implicit hidden agendas in mind. So that was actually my idea and not to play this long, worn-out game of who is in the Balkans, who is out, where the Balkans begin, where they end, how the borders shifted over time. This is a story told many times, and, and uh, by now um, this debate doesn't seem to be of interest to anyone else. But the extent to which the Balkans as a place of self-identification 
emerged, became, be, uh, the box became an active concept, is where I try to, to, to draw my attention and to see who and why did it and with what agendas in mind. Because I'm trying to show how deeply these regional uh, regionalizations and regional frameworks interact with issues of identity, of approach to modernity, of approaching nation, the nation in terms of its place in the transnational forces processes, but also in the way the region mediated the positioning of the nation in global processes, in general history, and so on. So this whole dialectics of building identi collective identity and how national and regional fed on each other in this, in this process. And I think that the answer to your question about, on the one hand, the way Romanians envisaged Southern Dobroja, and as a matter of fact, the story of Northern Dobroja some decades before that is not so much different. Um, goes into this direction in explaining, uh, uh, in, or rather uh, throwing light on this very um, intricate interplay of national and regional. We are used to think that the regional is uh, a superior viewpoint to the national, I mean, in the, in the age of transnationalism and post-nationalism. We tend to think that the regional uh, offers a superior viewpoint, a superior paradigm uh, that transcends the narrow national framework. Historically, however, this had not been the case. Historically, these two uh, self-identifications or these the two frameworks and self-positioning uh, uh, were acting uh, in, a, in, a, in a very close inter, uh, interaction. Very often, national geopolitical frameworks were transposed on the, on the regional. And the regional uh, started to act as a proxy for the, for, for the national. There were other cases in which the regional served to buttress national, uh, uh, national, national agendas. So it is a complex interplay, and the spokesmen of regionalism themselves operated on different registers, often in, ve in the very same text. And Jorge is a perfect, wonderful uh, example in this case. Nationalist and regionalist at the same, at the same time. Oh, Which is, in fact, the, if you look at uh, the Romanian area, or in general at the Eastern European area from the, from the West, uh, another Romanian that started a little bit early, who got the, the prestige of being almost a federalist, Aurel mm -hmm. Cepopovic, was mm -hmm. in fact a staunch uh, nationalism up to, uh, nationalist up to anti-Semitism and autochthonism, yeah. that uh, could sell his, uh, let's say, uh, quasi-imperial, imperialistic and uh, transnational agenda, although uh, obviously he was uh, trying to play the card of a Romanian nationalist. Yeah. Uh, and it, this, this, uh, these ambiguities exist in all cases. In the case of Romania, Jorga included the hegemonic intentions they had with, for, with the Balkans, mm -hmm. made them look into a self-inclusion, uh, look for a self-inclusion in the area with a very modest uh, design of uh, running it, of uh, ruling over it. Uh, you can find the nice, uh, you know, uh, matrimonial uh, uh, policy <laughs> of Queen Mary, uh, the yeah. mother-in-law of the Balkans, uh, who, through matrimonial and dynastic alliances, is covering the entire field. Uh, and this is a kind of ambiguous, as I, I think, uh, self-positioning. Mm -hmm. A self-inclusion as the getting is good, and then uh, a possibility of exclusion, of self-exclusion and then separation when the getting gets tough. Uh, and <laughs> Romanians have always been in this. Uh, in this. I, I'm talking, of course, only about the principalities, the Danubian principalities, Moldavia and Olekia, 
and then af uh, after it about the Greater Romania. Because the memory of uh, uh, the time when uh, the Banatos, the Pashaluk, uh, Timisoara, or Orada are forgotten. Nobody wants to remember that. How very Ottoman they all are, mm -hmm. up, all the way up to Vienna. But that is forgotten. But if we look at only the situation after the Enlightenment, obviously uh, Transylvania has had nothing to do with, with the Balkans, or not interested, uh, were totally shocked by uh, crossing the, the Carpathians already, uh, uh, still in the 1830s was a shock for Transylvanians because they discovered, uh, as your Koto Dragushano, uh, uh, Diana is very familiar with our 19th century, upon crossing the Carpathians, uh, discovers in Bucharest that all these people are speaking all kinds of languages. And he says, here I am in Romania's Babylon. But he was coming from a different Babylon, where other languages were spoken in the streets in, in Transylvania. Only yeah. this was not his Babylon. Yeah. And he was completely uh, uh, taken aback and uh, simply couldn't. Uh, and this lasts until uh, uh, after World War I, when people like Joran, upon crossing the Carpathians, discovers that everybody spoke French in, uh, in Bucharest, mm -hmm. of which he knew nothing. Uh, mm. So. Uh, uh, these ambivalences <clears throat> developed, I think, quite interestingly during the Greater Romania period. Yeah. Hence, uh, 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 Yorga and Papa Costa. Even though I, I would say that actually started earlier with Yorga and his first yes. institute, because uh, he cleverly coined the notion of Southeastern Europe as the historical cultural region he was going to deal with. Why? Because it nicely subsumed the Balkans into this into this uh, area, but at the same time avoided the this Orientalist and and uh, Balkanist and uh, Ottomanist connotations of of the term, and the third place, but not least, uh, but not uh, uh, yeah indeed uh, uh, least, um, that was a way for him to prove the unity of the Roman-speaking population, the Vlachs to the south of the Danube, yes. to the bigger Romanian realm. Therefore, the southeastern Europe perfectly served to his mind, and he went, went, uh, went uh, at, at uh, uh, big lengths to prove why, why, uh, why this should be so, but he proudly defended what he called our own Balkanism. So the Vlachs are our own Balkanism. So it's a Again, uh, an intricate and very interesting play with notions, with concepts, whereby different policies become transparent behind it. And uh, in this sense, I would say that uh, it was not with the beginning. Be useful uh, at some point. And Papa Costa, of course, was picking up uh, the discussion uh, in the 1930s uh, of uh, anthropogeography. <laughs> which had its, its itinerary. Of course, it all started around 1900, mm -hmm. already in the end of the, the, the 19th century, but it was growing slowly. Jorga himself, uh, he was always hesitating between uh, this age-old, let's say, uh, racial, in that sense, of, uh, na in the sense of national uh, or proto-national, uh, ethnic uh, commonality of the Balkan uh, uh, Peninsula as our normal Romanian extension. Yeah. Uh, that was one thing. And then he moved on to uh, the fact that we had a legitimacy that had, was related to, the, to Byzantium mm -hmm. and to the fact that we had preserved the Byzantine legacy. So if you uh, uh, refute his claim that we have something to do uh, nationally, ethnically, linguistically, he comes up with the political identity and the theological political tradition of Byzantium. So each way you go, he keeps you in the Balkans, but as a hegemonic, yeah. uh, as a hegemon. Exactly. That, was, that was the position of, of, uh, of most Romanian authors writing about mm -hmm. the Balkans. Mm -hmm. uh, preserving a hegemonic position, uh, claiming uh, the role of an arbiter, if not of a ruler. Yeah. even in the most unexpected situations. Mm -hmm. uh, and to this, uh, Romania is exceptional only as, as we discussed and I uh, was trying to prove in writing that Romanians have this bizarre uh, capacity of 
having uh, um, transformed at some point in uh, their most abstract form of poetry, in the poetry of Jon Barbo, uh, in modernist poetry, interwar modernist poetry, the Balkans into an object of absolute abstraction and even a kind of equivalent of the historical sublime. Uh, and that's uh, extraordinary because this it means moving completely out of history, geography, uh, politics, and everything, and uh, positing the the Balkans as uh, uh, the zenith mm -hmm. of the human condition. Which yeah. is, uh, if you compare to this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the other interesting Romanian peculiarity that at some point. For instance, from the 1980s and in the 1990s, in popular culture, Romanians have started to imitate, to play Balkan, to uh, uh, take turbo folk uh, music from <laughs> Yugoslavia, to uh, go up, all the way up to Zoran Bregovic, to reinvent themselves as a kind of urban avatars mm. of the Balkans, mm. which is quite uh, another new take on the in, in recent urban culture. In fact, one of the most striking discoveries while working on, on, uh, on this book has been the uh, stunning coincidence of the uh, peak of what we would call later Orientalist discourse about the Balkans in the interwar period. Yes. And this is, for example, in the center of Maria Todorova's discussion, mm. of course, and the later uh, followers in the I mean, later scholars in the same tradition, and the consistent, strenuous, and extremely ambitious, but also competent work done in the Balkans on the part of the Balkan scholars and intellectuals to fully rehabilitate the Balkans and turn it into a positive yes. self description, self positioning, to turn it into not just an active concept which needs to be treated in its subjective and, and, and uh, uh, positive way, but also as self, something self-assertive. It, it became a notion via which they fought their peripherality. And this is very interesting yes. because, because it goes against one of the main messages of the Orientalist paradigm whereby uh, uh, self-perception, I mean, the subaltern doesn't speak, yes. is unable to represent no. themselves. Now, the idea, that what, what actually comes out from, from, uh, from what, I, what the materials I was, I was dealing with was exactly the opposite. Yes. I mean, these guys were talking loud and with very assertive voices. Yes. And they really came up with an alternative vision of, of the Balkans, which, by the way, covered a number of disciplines, from economy to poetry to the avant-gardist movements. And what you what you are saying is is very much in the vein of the Zenit Yugoslavia avant-gardist movement, which joined with this uh, in this movement of. Uh, uh, recuperating uh, the Balkans <clears throat> and and as a concept, they didn't operate with Southeastern Europe. No. This, is in, this is interesting, and not because the German Nazis at the time operated with this notion. No. It was because the Balkans was was the one historical um, uh, topos and concept which captured the individuality. Southeastern Europe was considered faceless, no. anonymous. Uh, uh, lacking real, real meaning and connotation and reverberation mm -hmm. in, in, in the imagination. So for me, the even temporal coincidence of the Western denigrating discourse and the one in the Balkans, to me, was the strongest uh, incentive behind the whole behind the whole project of writing this book, because it raised the question number one of the legitimacy of excluding the scholarly discourses from any discussion of Orientalism, of any Western yes. conceptualization of, of, of the Balkans, especially if you address the nexus of knowledge and power and how you can then put in brackets epistems and regimes of truth on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, then you have to face to take seriously 
the ways local actors not just react to the outside image, but create their own symbolic geographies, their own uh, their own uh, spaces, their own uh, others, uh, and operate with their identity on the one hand vis-à-vis -vis the nation and vis-à-vis -vis Europe. So this uh, this uh, uh, interplay was to me uh, 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 at the center of my of my of my attention, and uh, I found this amazing. Uh, not least because it turned out that the post-Second World War massively institutionalized, state-supported Balkanist movement borrowed full sail the methodological and theoretical Not toolkit so. of the pre-war interwar uh, yeah. Balkanists. And recycled some of the expertise that Very was already so. trained uh, during so. World War II. Yes. But, but at mean, the same time, it is also yes. interesting to see that at a time when the Balkans was not in the in the uh, uh, discourse in the tongue of uh, Western of Western analysts, because Eastern Europe at that time, after the Second World War, very was much an devoured, it, 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 it devoured the Balkans as, as, as a region. Exactly at um, uh, at that time, the Balkans emerged as this 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 uh, uh, at this project. But interestingly, the interwar guys. Epistemically, I mean, epistemologically, put uh, 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 turned out to be much more creative and to to have been able to create concepts and methods that were really at par with European level. The post Second World War adepts who borrowed wholesale this methodology and this concept, etc., etc. Ironically enough, despite all this institutional uh, support and 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 state promotion failed to go beyond that phase. They basically, uh, they basically resorted to collecting empirical data, no. usually in national chunks, no. chunks, and devolved on Western powerhouses and think tanks, so to speak. The, the, concepts. The, the concept, the whole conceptual work, the whole integrative synthesizing and and uh, creative interpretive, interpretive interpretative sorry interpretative work. But there is something that that uh, that caused uh, this transformation that determined this transformation, namely that the intellectual materials from methods to concepts to theories to paradigms that were being used in the interwar period throughout the, the, the region in such an extraordinary way to promote new ideas such as, for instance, the commonality of the, of the population, the Homo Balkanicus mm -hmm. uh, general idea, be it a dynamic uh, type or whatever, more encompassing Homo Balkanicus. Mm -hmm. All these things were based on, as I said, ideas and concepts that had been associated with the right and the extreme right during World War, uh, during especially during World War II, yeah. uh, and thus uh, were uh, completely thrown overboard uh, mm -hmm. after 1945. And it, it's a very interesting uh, uh, phenomenon of uh, oblivion of. Uh, in the beginning, it was uh, 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 they wanted to forget uh, about all these things, mm -hmm. and they, of course, they had to, uh, you know, change the uh, uh, the first shelf in the libraries and hide the books that were discarded, the books or put them in the drawer. The books that belonged to those authors that had been too close were mm -hmm. even part of the uh, uh, right wing uh, movements, intellectual and political, in throughout the Balkans. Mm -hmm. So uh, suddenly uh, a list of authors and of books became uh, difficult to mention. Uh, with that, uh, any kind of theoretical or speculative work became dangerous and started to be avoided. And that's very, it's a very interesting, to me, uh, a very interesting transformation. You see that what survives is the very technical study, as you said, of the Balkans. Uh, 
languages, philologies, uh, documents that continue to be edited all the time, published, and so forth. All kinds of new revelations that do not change anything, and especially that do not uh, serve to build a theory or a vision of any kind. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is to me quite interesting. And in the case of Romania, for instance, the, the first uh, author, and to a large extent the only author, who actually went prior to 1989 beyond that, uh, uh, let's say, technical paradigm of pure erudition that avoids at all costs, including theoretical mm -hmm. uh, costs and credibility costs, any kind of theoretical claim, of higher claim, was Alexandru Dutsu. Alexandru Dutsu at the Institute of South European Studies was the first to reclaim for the field uh, a theoretical ambition, of an over-encompassing. Now, his, uh, uh, as you know, his uh, first training was in theology, and thus he was quite close to these discussions from the interwar uh, in which he was too young to participate. But then he studied uh, uh, English, uh, uh, philology and literature, and he came up with comparative literature as the tool for re, or as a way of retooling Southeast European studies and uh, in Romania and making these specialists uh, ambitious again. Yes, with one qualification though, because Mihai Berza, yes. number one, he bridged the pre-war and second uh, post, post He reopened generation. the institute yeah. in 1963. Yeah. Yeah. Even though Papa Kostya was the, the, the primary force. driving yes. force, yes. but he was sidelined for obvious reasons, and he died very, very uh, uh, already while this, this was, this was uh, underway, I mean, the, the re-establishment of the institute. But Mihai Berze is a very interesting case, because he actually smuggled in much of the theoretical not only conceptual toolkit, but also the theoretical energy and drive. And he was the one to actually begin with intellectual history, yes. with the history of the Enlightenment, as the history of ideas, as he, he used to, 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 to frame it. And uh, he did something which, I mean, again, we have to distinguish from national cases to national cases, because Romania, until the, uh, the late, um, 1960s, very early 1970s, was really an example of an innovative attitude and, and treatment and approach to, to Balkan studies, to regional studies. On the one hand, under the umbrella of intellectual history due to, to Berza, but also, and not without his involvement again, with the incorporation of the Annal School. Yeah. I mean, the conferences they used to, I mean, the Institute used to organize here at the end. I mean, the, all the major figures of the Annal, the, 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 the third generation of the Annal School uh, came to, book, to yeah. Bucharest. Yeah. You know? Around 1970, this was a relatively common uh, uh, thing, yeah. and this peaked in 1980 with the organization of the Co World mm -hmm. Congress of mm -hmm. Historical Sciences in Bucharest, which was also started by Beza. Yeah. He died before seeing this yeah. happen, but uh, he had started the whole yeah. thing. And yeah. For the younger audience, it was uh, Lucian Boya who uh, was appointed by uh, Beza as a uh, uh, secretary of the International Commission for uh, History and Theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and but, so it, he was the artisan of this uh, rapprochement yeah. between... Uh, and uh, he actually yes. attracted Dutsu. Yes. I mean, yes. Dutsu yeah, yeah, was, yeah. Dutsu his, was, his was brought into yeah, this, yeah. brought into this yeah. from uh, his uh, theological... Mm -hmm. And he actually continued in the 1980s mm -hmm. when he published his yeah. most important books, mm -hmm. uh, this combination which... Uh, uh, in his case, uh, 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 changed abruptly after 1990, when we finally discovered what Alexander Dutsu wanted to say, indeed, mm -hmm. uh, when he uh, forgot about uh, comparative literature and everything else, and went back to Byzantium, uh, Orthodox uh, mm -hmm. Christianity, mm -hmm. and traditions. So, uh, and he, he died upon these, uh, because I remember my uh, correspondence and my many conversations with Alexandru Dutsu, uh, especially prior to a conference uh, 20 years ago in 1998, 
mm-hmm. uh, on the intellectual history of Romania, culture and identity. Uh, and prior to that and after that, prior to that to get him to write a number of things for uh, to participate and to write something. And then after that, upon discussing between the two of us <laughs> what had been going on at the... And he came up with a, with a completely new uh, thing in which I couldn't recognize the Alexander Dutso of the 1980s, but now I could see the, the staunch conservative, uh, 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 you know, almost orthodoxist uh, that he had probably always been. Mm-hmm. Uh, which uh, is another complexity. But tell me about some, uh, something is, yes. May I just, just uh, interject here briefly because I'm in Romania and cannot stop with Berza uh, just here. I've been also struck by the extremely modern, enlightened definition, more implicit than explicit, that Berza gave to any kind of region, mm-hmm. which goes into the grain of uh, the ongoing, at present, the ongoing debate about the construction of space. Mm. He said, let us leave this talk about the geographical Balkans and the boundaries, etc. When we talk about a region, or any space one would think, let's begin from the human yes. deeds. And if we have to follow how humans behave and what they did and, and, and the actual scope of human action, then we'll come close to what really counts as a legitimate definition of any analytical space. He said, from this point of view, in certain cases, for certain periods, Greece or Serbia may be counted out of the Balkans. In other cases, Romania can be in or out of the Balkans. So he had a very uh, enlightened, indeed, very uh, contemporary, from our point of view, a vision about 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 these things. And uh, uh, he's an amazing scholar who I fear has not been given the due the due credit so far in the Romanian context uh, uh, as well. That's true. One one possibility is that he was, uh, how shall I say, um, he was doing something that the Annal School had done. Uh, already from the 1930s, mm-hmm. didn't have enough time to radiate throughout Europe because of the war, mm-hmm. was now being slowly rediscovered and had to be um, based on, I mean, very, based very cautiously on uh, ideas such as material culture, everyday life, mm-hmm. things that would move away from politics, ideology, uh, and in this, uh, uh, closer to a kind of Marxist nouvelle histoire kind of reading of history. Mm -hmm. He couldn't possibly mention the references of the interwar when dealing with the same topics. Uh, For instance, one thing that was completely out of uh, of, of the table at the time was anything having to do with spirituality, religion, uh, imagine the Kur- Bulgaria uh, has uh, uh, a peak uh, in uh, this kind of spiritualist uh, uh, discussion of, uh, of yeah. Bulgarianness uh, in the 1930s, 40s. Mm-hmm. They come to a point when they are applauded by the Germans. Tell me a little bit about that. What what came of this? Uh, it was not a current. It was a one author, or maybe not more than one, uh, who suddenly, uh, because we are all tempted in uh, all the countries in this area, let's say it's a region, a historical region, uh, by escaping history, which was difficult to quote, to mention, uh, uh, a difficult memory to, to, to revive, uh, to escape into something primordial. A socialist. You had the Thracians, we had uh, them too, uh, we had the uh, Bulgarian uh, king, uh, uh, Tsardom Empire, we wanted to, uh, a part of it as well, and we called it a Bulgarian Romanian uh, uh, Empire, and things of this sort. There was always a, 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 an attempt 
to endow the nation with something more primordial mm -hmm. and more spiritual in the same time. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about that episode in, in Bulgaria. To me, that is quite interesting. The third is the fourth is when, because it parallels uh, developments that we are familiar with in Romania. Absolutely, but I, I can tell you that that Yugoslav case is not, oh, is not different yes, with Vornikovic yes. or yes. even even uh, basically uh, one might say positivist scholars like uh, Peter Skok and and Budimir. Milan Budimir, who founded the uh, the Balkanological Institute yes. in uh, in Belgrade and edited this high quality, really really high quality international journal in the in the 1930s, even these guys were not at all immune to this kind of uh, ontological, cultural, morphological discourse and and so on. Uh, and you've written on this uh, extensively, and and and. Uh, it is obvious that on the one hand it goes into the fashion, the intellectual fashion of the time across Europe and, and the Balkans and Eastern Europe made no exception. And it is indeed amazing that it was on the on the ground of this anti-modernist ontological uh, autochthonist discourses that for once East and West were really in dialogue, Absolutely. communication, Absolutely. and and no hierarchical. Uh, 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 and there was communication both ways. <laughs> Transfers are really bo happening both ways. Absolutely. Not Absolutely. only uh, would uh, Eastern Europeans go to study like they had started already in the 19th century in Western universities, but. Uh, Westerners are interested in the discussions here, in the Absolutely. conversation here. Absolutely, and uh, again, if we can, if we may talk about uh, East-West transfer, conceptual yes. transfer, it is precisely the 30s and the, yes. and the early 40s where we can clearly see how much, for example, uh, the heroisches Lebensform, for example, uh, uh, invented by Zwieć, and all these rhetorics of, uh, of uh, um, 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 uh, ethnopsychology uh, was exported to Germany and then turned back with Gesemann, for example, yes. and his and his uh, um, heroization of the Montenegrins as the prototype of the uh, um, the prototype of uh, um, um, of the real real Balkan and the real manliness, yes. but also an example of what the Germans themselves, the Teutons, once used to be, and what they had lost under the impact of, of, of the West. Exactly. It is something that had happened in the 19, in the 1840s with the Romanians showing Michelet, yeah. the prototype of uh, the virtues of uh, ancient peoples mm -hmm. that everybody had lost in, in the West, especially the French, and now they had to look to the North in order to find those virtues. Now Germans were looking in every direction, <coughs> and finally, enough, I have to say for us that they found yeah. such a prototype of uh, Ur uh, humanity mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. uh, in in the Balkans. Yeah, but there was there was this because you asked me about about the Bulgarian story. Yeah. Uh, there was a certain competition who would yes. come up as more Balkanite yeah, at, at that point. I mean, uh, for example, Maiden Shaitanov, one of these yes. extreme righteous guys yes. you were yes. referring yes. to. Shaitanov, I have to huge... say, is one of my favorites. <laughs> so, uh, because he he managed to to teach the Germans how to do it. Look how to and do that, it. I yeah. think, is. Uh, and also rhetorically, I mean, yes. he, he was amazing, amazing person. He published a huge, massive volume, uh, uh, evocatively titled Bulgarian Dash Balkan. Titanism. Titanism, of course. You know, uh, no yes. less, no more. So, um, but the Germans uh, loved it. That, yeah. That's the. I mean, if you if you tell them to Bulgaria as at home, they may love yeah. it. But yeah. for the Germans to 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 admire it, that I think is quite something. And your reference to the turbofolk and yeah. all these artistic imitations of the Balkan style at, at present is, is in a certain sense replay of what we, what we, we already see in the interwar years. Yeah. That is asserting your national individuality somehow takes aboard, kidnaps the regional symbolic, uh, the, uh, symbolic uh, uh, prestige, yeah. so to say, and, and to be Romanian now means perhaps 
having this style on board, I mean, being able to operate in this in this uh, exotic, in this uh, in this uh, 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 very different and very non-Western kind of of uh, of idiom. Well, I think that it southern is... Romania simply enjoy. I mean, people from southern Romania simply enjoy themselves. Uh, they, it started in the Banat uh, of all places, actually, because it was a, diffi- uh, a direct transfer from the from Vojvodina, the Serbian Banat, into uh, mm-hmm. Romanian Banat in the 1970s and 80s, through people who are smuggling across the border in both, uh, especially from then, from there to here, uh, consumer goods. That this started, it it mm-hmm. generated echoes uh, all the way across the country. Mm-hmm. At wedding parties and celebrations and so forth, it already uh, started to emerge through uh, pirated uh, cassettes uh, in the 1980s. Became extremely popular throughout the country. Mm-hmm. So this is the first, uh, 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 let's say, stratum of uh, turbo folk in in Romania. It's the the early 80s. Mm-hmm. In the early 80s, this is across the country. Mm-hmm. And uh, then, of course, it matured, and it uh, got a certain uh, highbrow dimension through the imitation of uh, the Zoran Bregovician <coughs> kind of... Uh, Infiltrated uh, jazz, for yes, example, exactly. massively, and... Uh, yeah. When, uh, uh, when uh, for instance, uh, jazz uh, uh, musicians started to play ethno-jazz, mm-hmm. then it was a sign that already they are looking for something. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah. My uh, a very close friend of mine, uh, uh, jazz composer and blues and uh, you know, musician Harita Vitian, actually saw this uh, uh, opening in the 1980s already, and he was starting to to work on all these materials. His being an Armenian living in Constanza, he was let's say probably more sensitive to all these influences than other people living somewhere else, and uh, through a very interesting concoction of uh, uh, Caucasian, uh, Dobrogean, Balkan uh, uh, kind of music. He was uh, all uh, uh, grafted on uh, modernist music, Eric Satie, and on free jazz. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He came up with this kind of uh, extremely, extremely complex uh, music in which you, from time to time, you hear the Balkan percussion, or you mm-hmm. see something that rem- reminds you of something mm-hmm. Balkan. Uh, this is another way, uh, an equivalent of, let's say, what I called sublimation, like in the poetry of Johan Barthel. Mm-hmm. Something that the raw materials are stigmatized. Mm-hmm. You pick them up mm-hmm. and you turn them upside down and you mm-hmm. uh, dematerialize them. You, you operate a kind of, if I am being pardoned, really a transfiguration, a, a metamorphosis. Yeah. You really turn them into yeah. an absolutely abstract, pure, high yeah. uh, uh, cultural element that is totally out of reach for the common mortal. But also is a deep subversive gesture. Yes, yes uh, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. Because it turns the stigma upside down, it, that is, it turns it into prestige. Yeah. Uh, what about Greece? How do you see the Greeks in, in this uh, in this? Because for the for the South Slavs and Romanians, things are I think more clear. Uh, the Greeks had to struggle with their Balkanness. Uh, how do you? What is your take on this? Uh, the Greek case, even though my. My my uh, stru- the structure of the book is 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 uh, chronologically ordered, yes. not by countries. Yes, I know. Therefore, therefore, I w- I never, for example, make any uh, major distinction between the Greek discourse and 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 the others. But um, I take note of the peculiar situation of the Greeks, which of course have their own. Um, Imperial imagination yeah, exactly. at play, yeah, yeah. and uh, and um, uh, but at the same time also Mediterranean and and uh, yes. uh, seaside uh, yeah. um, um, or, that is oriented to the sea, to the sea uh, perspective. Um, the special place Greece occupies in the Western imagination yeah. also plays a role. There, there is an, a number of of, uh, of gradients that we can uh, we can uh, refer to to explain the more 
um, the, the peculiar uh, uh, trajectory of uh, Greek regionalisms. But if we stick to, if we go to the interwar period, in fact, um, uh, it, it was the Greek Prime Minister Papanastasiou, who was an intellectual, he was an academic, in fact, who was very much at the basis of the Balkan Pact. And um, he was someone who made very explicit the intrinsic link and embeddedness of Greece in the Balkan, in the Balkan context. And that uh, lived on until, as, as a, 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 a the, the participation of the Greek scholars into these international fora that emerged within the region was equal to everybody else's. Yes. And they were not in, in demand, that is to say, they, they fully subscribed to this idea that here we have this regional agenda. And uh, uh, that, this is, it, it indeed lasted until the end of the Second World War, when with the geopolitical reshuffling, suddenly Greece and Turkey were written off the region. And as a matter of fact, this began in the West rather than in the region yes. itself, when suddenly uh, uh, the, the region was split into uh, uh, into two uh, into two sub uh, two, into two sub regions. The end of the Cold War uh, produced what may be called Greece's orphanage. Yes. The Greeks became orphan to the geopolitical division. They don't uh, know which way to turn. Which which way to turn? And that was the moment when they rediscovered their Balkanness again. So Greece became a regional power in geopolitical terms and cultural player uh, uh, after, after ATM in the 90s, in the 1990s. Although, of course, they have their, uh, uh, their peculiarities as well. I have this uh, book by Augusta Dimu, Entangled Buts Towards Modernity, mm -hmm. where something which we didn't mention, which is the uh, the complication of the ideological complexities of this self-positioning or other positioning in the, in the Balkans, because uh, we mentioned the, the right and far right uh, luminaries who placed the, uh, their countries in, on the map of the Balkans. Uh, there is also the, let's say, the populist, left uh, populist, uh, peasantist uh, international, for instance, which was associating uh, very strictly uh, Balkanness and peasantness, yep. uh, making it the a kind of rural uh, Arcadia uh, mm -hmm. of uh, the Zadruga, of the uh, shepherds and everything else. Uh, on the western side as well. On, really the, uh, on the western, western side, side as well. So this is, uh, this is something which uh, is uh, um, there is a, a, a lot of self-othering in this uh, thing, where people, uh, uh, you know, pose as uh, the inhabitants, the happy inhabitants of this Arcadian uh, territory, a kind of self-invention uh, uh, as Morlaki. Uh, suddenly, all these uh, uh, Balkan populations become a kind of Morlaki, kind of bizarre, mysterious, but happy living in the mountains, uh, oblivious of everything around them, and maybe, maybe uh, racially distinct, if not racially superior, like mm -hmm. you already had in uh, Zvij or in uh, people who are talking about the human, this commonality of the human beings in the, in the Balkans. Uh, but interestingly, interestingly, uh, Sorin, uh, that was one of one of the other discoveries that I came across. That that uh, by the way already thematized in in uh, in, in in the in uh, contemporary British literature. That actually the um, praise of the Bulgarian peasant, oh, sorry, the Balkan peasant, oh. the uh, Balkan um, patriarchal commune and family was seen as a progressive project in the 1880s, 1890s, in Britain of yes, all places. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, at the hands of the liberal Balkan experts, yes. uh, 
uh, the Balkan commune, because they didn't ma make even distinctions nationally, they would see yeah, yeah, it yeah, as, yeah. A, as a as an yes, as yes, a, yes. A overarching uh, social social form. The Balkan commune was the breeding. Um, a zone for self-government, yes. democratic or, if you wish, representative uh, uh, political uh, political culture, and also the uh, institution that is capable to rejuvenate Europe yes. and to correct the moral harms done by urbanization, commercialization, Absolutely. industrialization. Absolutely. And this is amazing because at the same time, because it also indicates to what extent debates back home, that is domestic British debates, form the image of the Balkans. So you could see here in this Arcadia, peasant Arcadia of sorts that they're, that they're building, that they are actually projecting their own concerns with uh, the, 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 the mores, the, the public mores as infected by industrialization on the one hand, and on the other hand, their fight for agrarian for land reform, which was at the core of their, uh, of their uh, Absolutely. Uh, looking quarrels at, with the conservatives. Yeah, so. yeah, looking at rural England in the light, uh, late 19th century, uh, they thought of, uh, of a new utopia, that utopia mm -hmm. was rural. Uh, so, I discussed this with Gregory Clays, who is a specialist of Utopia, uh, the fact that the peculiarity of Romania and countries in the Balkans, that rather than having the city as Utopia, we have the village as Utopia. Uh, and that changes. Our polis is the village. You see, where does that uh, We uh, This means that these Utopian uh, uh, projections, regressive or progressive in the case of the left-leaning uh, peasantist movements, uh, Stamboliev and everybody else, in the, which also touched uh, Romania with a left-leaning uh, peasantist party, which of course uh, was uh, then ascribed a kind of uh, different identity after 1990 when it was reinvented, it was supposed to be on the right. These are left-leaning, left-center, left, -center, left, -center, left uh, agrarian parties. Uh, which had this international uh, vision. But uh, somehow uh, people in the West came to think that this was a possibility of going back and correcting uh, the wrong uh, ways of the West by looking at this. Uh, so suddenly this uh, peasantist, uh, or let's say proto-ecologist uh, uh, visions of the, of the Balkans became inspirational. Uh, one point about the, uh, the about Greece. Uh, I was um, you remember this conference in on the island of Halki mm -hmm. when uh, talking about uh, memory history and so forth uh, twenty years ago. And uh, uh, the ho our host, the Greek gentleman who gave the first uh, uh, talk at this uh, conference, uh, it was a very nice uh, early night, and he started and uh, to. It was all about forgetting the demons of the past, overcoming the conflicts, da da da, moving into the mm -hmm. beautiful uh, uh, future of democratic uh, uh, mutual uh, appreciation and things of the sort. Uh, and we should just forget all these monsters of the past. In, in, in general, history pretty much could be uh, done away with and so forth. And he started to speak. And then his speech started with before Pericles and so forth. <laughs> so, so he uh, he was very well intended. Besides, he was also sponsoring very generously the conference. And Maria Todorova took my hand and told me, <laughs> behave, behave, because he's going to say very interesting things about Greece. So the thing was, let us bring all the other Balkan countries to Greece, put them on the nice island of Halki, and teach them a nice lesson to to be democratic. The way to do this, he started with uh, <laughs> the pre-Socratics. Uh, so this is their last resort. And this is in, when you look into uh, 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 some of the Greek authors talking about uh, the Balkans, you feel that they have a last resort. They have Pericles to, or the pre-Socratics uh, uh, waiting in the, in the wings. So in case you think that they are not so, uh, and they belong in the Balkans, and the Balkans is not such a great idea, uh, 
Alexandru Palologu, the Romanian essayist and uh, uh, socialist and uh, mm -hmm. uh, mentor of some uh, uh, young uh, people in Romania, used to say once that uh, uh, used to say that well, Socrates was a Balkan person. Mm -hmm. eh? mm -hmm. uh, Socrates was, was from the Balkans. It's true, uh, Aristotle as well, but uh, you know, uh, things are not exactly the same. Some parts that were less bold. Than that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. So, uh, uh, this was never. Uh, uh, and another point I want to make this is a co production, uh, the Balkans. It is, has always been uh, so, but not only in the sense that discourses uh, developed in the West are uh, sold to the Balkans. Um, also in the sense that I would like to uh, mention once more, which is the fact that at various times in the development of these discourses, they represented the cutting edge of social sciences and humanities. Mm -hmm. At each of these moments, you, taking, uh, you can take it up from the 1880s with uh, human geography for this, anthropogeography, all the way down to the end of the interwar period, at all times, the debates about the Balkans represented, from a technical, methodological, theoretical point of view, the cutting edge of science. So, uh, uh, and it is uh, thus no uh, uh, accident that uh, they were also communicating, which I also, I also wanted to, to mention. These people, these authors, were Europeans, were circulating, were uh, uh, traveling all the time before the jet set, uh, were the proto jet setter or pre jet setters because they were all over the place, mm -hmm. uh, running uh, institutions, presiding over international societies. Uh, Yorga, of course, mm -hmm. being the vice president of the uh, Comité International de Sciences Historiques, uh, and things of the sort. Congresses being uh, held in Romania were almost being held here, were around the area. So there was a circulation of ideas which was complete with circulation of publications, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, High-level publications were produced in this area in foreign languages and distributed uh, in the scholarly community of the time. And uh, a lot of Western scholars were coming, coming here, and they, they were publishing in the local journals. Yes, the local yes. Journals. and they were happy to be invited, not only for the hospitality part of their uh, yeah. visit, but also for the uh, substantial part. And what is interesting is to see how much empirical work was done in the area by foreign scholars. Absolutely. Not only the casual visitors like before, the travelers and, Absolutely. you know, the uh, Kaiserlings and the Paul Morans. It's not only these, mm -hmm. uh, the diplomats and the, uh, the, you know, the dandies, but yeah. also serious scholars who are coming to the area, developing long-term connections to the area, uh, which is something that uh, almost evaporated during the communist period, mm -hmm. but was reborn with, 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 with the exceptions. With the exception oh. of the German, German engagement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, because yes, that, yes. That, that remained a yeah. constant. Yeah, uh, that remained a constant. I mean, our friend uh, Stefan Trost is, uh, <laughs> is a very nice uh, incarnation of this continuity. I mean, That's you, right. can, uh, you yeah. can look at the concept of uh, historical regions mm -hmm. and uh, from Halecki to Trost, Continuity. Through Zundhausen. Through Zundhausen. <laughs> uh, you have a, a line of con a continuous reflection yeah. upon uh, the historical regions which, uh, yes, remained uh, yeah. quite active yeah. and uh, recently, of course, has resurfaced. Okay. Is there, uh, are there comments and questions? Uh, we have Diana Mishkova with us tonight. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, Ellen Cotta. More questions, yeah. I was wondering, you were talking about this, uh, this uh, pro-Balkan British liberals uh, mm -hmm. via Zadruga. And uh, I, I was wondering if they were also pro-Russian via the mid or uh, the Russian or a different, Russian or a different case for them. You mean on the part of the British liberals? The British liberals were, were saying that they were in love with uh, the patriarchal Balkan social structure. Yeah. Yeah, and that's true. That's what, true. What is the same case with the patriarchal Russian social structure? Which, uh, similar, like, 
I wouldn't I wouldn't say so it on the part of the British but of course I cannot say for sure because I haven't looked into the British uh, British writings on the on the Russian mir specifically but to the extent that the Russian mir was very much kidnapped by the Slavophiles yes. It somehow, at the time when Slavophilism was on the rise in the second half of the 19th century, precisely at the, the time we, when we are uh, uh, discussing, uh, somehow precluded, quite quite uh, uh, understandably precluded, precluded uh, a similar uh, approach to uh, a similar approach to the Russian Mir. To me, what was stunning in this case was how. What was at the time generally perceived to be a pre-modern, backward social structure was taken aboard by the liberals in, in, in Britain and turned into a positive example for Europe, for Europe itself, and as a nurturing ground for uh, principles of self-government self and uh, uh, self-rule self and uh, sort of moral, moral strengths. The Russians are doing their own utopian building, I mean, visions based on the mirror themselves, and that they, they managed to export them quite successfully in many, in many ways. There's a very, uh, uh, there's very good scholarship on, uh, on this rural utopianism in, in Russia, which is, uh, 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 this is really a, a, an interesting topic that they has, uh, that has been developed over the last uh, decades. Uh, and some of these Russians live in, of course, in Switzerland now, but they live, they write about uh, uh, these, uh, uh, this peasant utopianism, which, uh, uh, well, which was based on, which was based on the myth. Uh, can we take another comment or one last question? Just, just a simple sentence question. Modernization Balkans. What kind of complex relationships are between them? Are there separately to be uh, discussed, or does this intellectual construct, in a way, of Balkan Balkanism, plays a, a let's say bad role or positive role, especially when we take into consideration this? driven uh, identity by modernity in South Eastern Europe. Yeah. This in itself is a big topic, I should say, uh, that deserves historicization. The answer given to this question on behalf of the my regional yeah. scholars differs from one period to another. Um, in the interwar period, my regionalists tended to devise an alternative Balkan modernity, a vision they, they, they strove to develop, to, to build uh, 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 an autochthonous uh, vision of modernity. In part, uh, going back to historical precedents and discovering, as, as it was so characteristic, typical of the time, the rudiments of modern political rule in ancient times, in, in, in some sense. In other sense, uh, how the whole historical fate, destiny, they, they were talking of Balkan destiny, etc. I mean, the Balkan vocabulary was really very rich at, at the time. How it cultivated uh, 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 democratic and modern spirit, and how, of course, now the time had come to re to really uh, 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 dig up this this past and this uh, these rudiments and to uh, to rejuvenate the West and and so on. So this was a kind of a kind of alternative more a, a Balkan modernity that they were that they were thinking of. The post Second World War, what we can say, but let's in its Marxist version. Ironically enough, even though they were talking of uh, the way imperialist Western powers had uh, perverted the, the, moder the modernity trajectory, the modernization of the Balkans, ended up by being staunch supporters of what at the time was called modernization theory. Mm -hmm. That is, they 
delved into uh, discovering the prerequisites of modernity as conceived by the Western uh, 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 hegemonic paradigm, to what extent these prerequisites were there, and from there trying to judge what were the prospects of this modernization. So it was always about lacks, absences, catching up, etc., yeah. etc. Et so uh, uh, ironically, ironically, they were uh, very much more in the vein of the Western modernization theory than in the vein of the also very fashionable at the time dependency theory yes, or uh, co-periphery theories, no. this new new Marxist but more subversive uh, kind of uh, intellectual. You read Elia Badescu in Romania and you see how uh, the combination yeah. between uh, 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 primordialist, uh, autochthonist, uh, radical autochthonism and world system theory. Mm -hmm. It's a very nice uh, spagat between, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Neolithic or the prehistory and uh, uh, Wallersea. Yeah. Uh, it's a Good. very interesting combination <laughs> which happened in the Balkans, among others. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Diana thank Mishkova, you. for thank this interesting talk. And the show must, must go on, so we have to get out of here as quickly as we can. Uh, thank you yeah, very much. Thank you, thank you. Sorry. What's your name?